I said this yesterday already, but it's kind of crazy how after making so many videos about the Canucks and the Oilers, I still kind of feel like there's more to talk about that we haven't gotten into yet. And in this video, what I wanted to do on the morning before game three was go out there and talk about some of the Edmonton Oilers ice times and strategies for this series. Because heading into game two, so two days ago, one of the big stories that everybody was kind of talking about was whether or not Leon Dreisaitl would be an option for the Oilers heading into that second game. And long story short, he ended up playing, and he did very, very well. If you just go over to the box score here and you take a look at that game two, you'll see that Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid each had a goal and three assists. These guys were dominant and... Look, there's really no stopping when those guys start putting in the work. But for Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid, the way in which they were used in this game was kind of indicative, you could say, to the injury concerns that we had had about Dreisaitl before Game 2 began. Because the Oilers played Dreisaitl and McDavid on the same line, and when you have that combination going out there, it becomes really easy to see why these are two of the best players in the world. They just dominate the place so well, they control possession in tight along the perimeter, and they're able to open up opportunities like nobody's business. But the thing is, when Connor McDavid in the postgame goes out there and says, oh yeah, this Oilers win, it was everybody. Everybody was pulling on the rope. It becomes a little easier to discredit that sentiment when you realize that McDavid and Dreisaitl played 28 and 27 minutes of the entire gosh darn game. It didn't even end in overtime too long after either. They played half the damn game. And so, with this in mind, it opens up the door to conversing about ice time, deployment, matchups, and whether or not this kind of thing is sustainable. Because, I don't know about you, but I don't know if playing your star players 28 minutes a night is a sustainable thing. Like, sure, if they're defensemen, you could debate that it's pretty normal, but for forwards to do that kind of thing? Yeah, no, that's not common at all. And when you consider the fact that they're even playing together, it's almost like that entire line didn't get much of a break throughout this game. Of course, it worked, so there might be an incentive to do it again, but again, how sustainable is that kind of a strategy? And furthermore, this opens the door up to what the Vancouver Canucks can do to respond to this, because when it comes to the guys that were playing against McDavid, here's a stat made by Jonathan Willis. Here's an interesting stat that will get lost in everything else last night. In the 12 minutes and 31 seconds of head-to-head -head 5v5 ice time with Beast Mode Connor McDavid and while being the target for number one Edmonton hitters, Quinn Hughes held his own. Shots were 4-3, and the attempts were 12-11. Just a magnificent player. As pointed out by Jason Greger, these numbers are for the whole series, not Game 2 alone. Willis regrets the error. And so, when it comes to the guys that can match up against McDavid and Dreisaitl, Quinn Hughes actually has been doing a pretty good job at that. Because when you talk about how good McDavid and Dreisaitl have been, here's another tweet. Archaeology guy went out there and tweeted this. Fun fact, McDavid and Dreisaitl just last night each had as many points as the Leafs top players had in their entire series. Their respective 1-3-4 scoring lines in Game 2 alone are the exact same lines that Matthews, Domi, and Bertuzzi had to lead the Leafs through seven games. Dan Murphy then replied saying this. Here's Edmonton with McDavid, Dreisaitl, Ekholm, and Bouchard on the ice at even strength in Game 2. Just over 19 minutes together, shot attempts were 35-6, to and the scoring chances were 19-2. to Expected goals for percentage, 86%. And so this is why you could very well say, if the Oilers decide to do this one more time, the Canucks could be in big trouble here. And when it comes to the guys they have trying to stop this tirade, I mean, we had seen it with a bunch of the goals scored in Game 2. Carson Soucy was getting burned, you got Tyler Myers not being able to keep up, Quinn Hughes is one of the only guys that can actually step up to the plate, and even then, I don't know if Philip Hronik has done a good enough job in being able to keep up either. It's just kind of Hughes. So, with Vancouver having this kind of a strategy put against them, for one, I think it's a good thing because it's like, yeah, Edmonton is respecting the Canucks so much that they need to do this. They need to have Drysaddle McDavid together playing half the damn game. They didn't need to do this with the LA Kings. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, no, that's an option they have. I don't know how long it's going to keep up for, but for as long as it is keeping up for, the Canucks are going to have to really step up their game. Now, there was the idea floating around there that because Drysaddle was kind of hurt, that's why they put him with McDavid. And... When they're on a roll, when they start scoring points, it's tough to pull them off, so that just kind of inevitably ended up happening. But if Dreisaitl is fully able to play, if he's not 
hurt or suffering from the same thing that he had in game one, and they decide to split the lines up then, then I think the Vancouver Canucks would have a little bit of an easier time defending against both of those guys individually. And I know, you know, you could say, Lego, you're kind of alluding to this idea that they're a two-player team, they're a one-line team, the power play merchant team. And look, I'm not going to go out there and say necessarily that I'm not alluding to that, but at the same time, you know, the Oilers have these two players and they're very good. What more do you want? They got some depth scoring from other guys throughout the lineup too. I mean, Cody Ceci scored a goal, Evan Bouchard, okay, he's not a depth scorer, but you get what I mean. There are some extra guys who are putting up numbers, and the Oilers rolling with this mcdavid Drysidle pairing has proven very dangerous in the earlier stages of this experiment. So, we'll see how the Vancouver Canucks are able to rebound from this. I wanted to also go over to the subreddit because this tweet made by Jonathan Willis goes out there and has a few comments that I thought were interesting to bring up. Shaftel goes out there and replies saying, I personally don't think Myers and Susie did well against McDavid and Drysidle at all. They made costly mistakes and were bogged down in the defensive zone a lot. Hopefully, the Canucks make adjustments and maybe play Hughes against that line instead. I think it's worth it to waste Hughes' minutes against this line if it gives us a chance to nullify the McDavid line. And that's another thing you have to think about as well. If you're playing Hughes against McDavid, it may severely limit the amount of offensive potential Quinn Hughes will have in the series, because if he's spending the majority of his time in his own zone trying to keep up with McDavid and Dreisaitl, sure, he might do a good job, but by the time they get the puck out, maybe the shift is a bit too long. Maybe he doesn't have enough gas in the tank to do his offensive stuff. So really, it's a bargain of X's and O's here. Do you want to say, put Hughes on against the McDavid line full time and limit the offensive productivity that Quinn could have? But if the trade-off is you're able to reduce Connor McDavid's effectiveness with Dreisaitl, is that a gamble that you take? Another reply goes out there and says, Susie and Myers were too slow to keep up with McDavid. Susie was lucky he caught up that one time because McJesus was not expecting it. Myers isn't really too slow, he just does a lot of boneheaded things. There's another one that goes out there and says here, those two guys, they left Drysaddle alone, and he just does this meditation thing with the puck, letting him go to an unchecked area, and Edmonton scores. Can't let him do that. He'll just levitate the puck across the crease to whomever, mostly Hyman, and the doors open for a goal. This team gives Drysaddle way too much time and space. And that's kind of what we were also thinking about as well. If the Canucks had knowledge that Drysaddle was hurt, this and that, then would it not be easier for them to target him? Like, you can bang and clatter all you want as to how that's not sportsmanlike or whatever, but at the end of the day, you know, this stuff happens and we know it's part of the game. Once players get hurt, you'll see players exploit that all the time. So for Leon Dreisaitl to be given all the time in the world, like he did in Game 2, was it a symptom of playing with Connor McDavid where it's like, yeah, no, we have to put all our attention on Connor, which is why nobody's checking Dreisaitl, nobody's trying to give him a tough time on the boards or whatever, he's just getting away unscathed with all this time and space. And what happened after that? Four points, a goal and three assists. So Vancouver could be in some serious trouble here, depending on how the Edmonton Oilers decide to roll out their lines in game three. We'll see how that goes down later tonight. Of course, we'll be back here with the post-game video once everything is said and done. But for now, if you're a Canucks fan, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below about how the dry saddle McDavid pairing has fared so far against this team, and whether or not you think it's as big of a deal as I do, to the point that we're even making a video like this in the first place. If you're an Oilers fan, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below about this entire thing? What are your opinions about the way in which you were playing these guys together? Is it projectable? Can you just roll with it as long as you can? And is this your ultimate strategy to defeating the Vancouver Canucks? Because so far in game two, I mean, it worked pretty well. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this Vishash Ross 99. And bye.